In Matthew chapter 2, we see the fulfillment of four unusual prophecies about the birth of Christ. Each seems to contradict the others. But today on Through the Bible, Dr. J. Vernon McGee tells us how they will all be literally fulfilled. And we'll also hear about a most unusual prophet. Can you guess who it is? Well, if you're on the World Prayer Team, then you know that we're traveling together through Eastern Africa this week, where God is answering our prayers in incredible ways. Greg is with us in the studio today, and he's ready to tell us all about it. <laughs> I love being in the studio and, and talking with you, talking with our listening family, Steve. It's such a privilege, isn't it, that we we get to focus on what God is doing to get his word to the four corners of the earth. And and this week, as you said, we are praying our way through Eastern Africa. I mean, Africa is an amazing continent, more than yep. 50 uh, countries, more than a billion souls, uh, hundreds and hundreds of languages spoken. And we're focusing our prayers on Eastern Africa in countries like Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania. And today we're going to Madagascar. Yeah. And it's, it's really common throughout all Africa, really, where solid bodies. Bible teaching is really hard to find, and and believers are seeking it out, and through the Bible is there providing it, not only on radio, but on all those different delivery methods that, that you like to talk about. Yeah, absolutely, and and that's part of our commitment. If you're a newer listener, if you've just been on the Bible bus a short time, we are serious about getting the whole Word to the whole world, and we, we will talk a lot. You will hear us talk a lot about getting it in every possible way. I've often said, if carrier pigeons were the most cost-effective way, yep. we'd do that. We would do it. Uh, but we're so excited about our, our ministry in Madagascar, and, and we're getting texts, which shows that people around the world like to communicate with us on their cell phones. Yeah. Here's one, for example, from Madagascar. It says, is it true that only those who have their church service on Saturday will be saved? Hmm. hmm. I'm wondering if they're hearing <laughs> yeah. some kind yeah, of funky doctrine out things. there. Yeah. I need a clear explanation from you, Pastor. And Steve, this really highlights the fact that not only do our follow-up teams, uh, you know, t answer requests, help lead people to salvation, they are using Dr. McGee's teaching as the basis to answer questions questions. And, you know, when Dr. McGee was here on earth with us, he had the Q&A program, which we continue to air on many stations yep. and on the internet. But each of our languages, the listeners have their own theological questions. So isn't it wonderful that that not only is there the teaching of Dr. McGee in Malagasy, the language of Madagascar, but they can answer questions based on Dr. McGee's yeah. theology. I also like the fact that regardless of where we live on this planet, we are still all human, sinful, fallen people that have a sin nature and need redemption. And this next text, I think, draws that out. It says, I really need to be free from the bondage of evil habits, the life under control of the devil. Please tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah, and that letter, it's such a great point that you've made, Steve. That letter could come from anywhere yeah. on earth. It could come from your town. It could come from your house. It yeah. could it could be uh, something that any, any person who wants to follow Christ is going to wrestle with this question of, we know theologically, the flesh, right? How do we deal with that? Wonderful, wonderful, powerful text. Now, here's another one. Hmm. When the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, what does that really mean? Hmm. I am a teen and I need to be changed to offer my life to Christ. Please advise me. Wow, that is such an insightful <laughs> question. And if you think about it on the face of it, it's like, am I supposed to be afraid of my Savior, my yes. Lord Jesus yeah. Christ? Well, no, there's some different aspects to that. And understanding the Bible and the way Scripture teaches helps this young teenager put words like that into perspective and to be able to trust Christ with certainty and have a godly fear of the Lord right. and still know that he is his Lord and Savior. And I think Dr. McGee would say to us, this is why we have to study the whole Bible, because mm -hmm. you need that balanced, um, multifaceted look at what does it mean what does it actually mean to fear the Lord? Yeah. Greg, would you pray for our brothers and sisters in Madagascar and also for today's study in Matthew? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you let us have a part in getting your word and the systematic teaching of it to brothers and sisters in Madagascar. I pray that you would build and strengthen your church in that country. And I pray you'd build and strengthen us as we study the wonderful gospel of Matthew today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. We come to the second chapter of Matthew, if you have your Bible, and we'll turn there, we'll put in at verse 12. Now you'll recall that we mentioned that chapter 2 shows the fulfillment 
of four prophecies that geographically seem very difficult of ever being fulfilled. He's to be born in Bethlehem. We saw that took place, and that he was to be called out of Egypt. We're yet to see that. And there was weeping in Ramah, and Ramah's north of Jerusalem, and called a Nazarene. And how could all of these be fulfilled? Well, they were literally fulfilled in the life of our Lord. Now the wise men who went to Bethlehem to see him after they had presented their gifts and had worshipped him. And I'd call attention to that. In verse 11, it says, they fell down and worshipped him, not them. And they presented unto him gifts. And the gold, as we said, speaks of who he is, his birth. And frankincense speaks of his life, the fragrance of his life down here. And myrrh speaks of his death. And we called attention to Isaiah 66, where it says, when he comes the second time again, wise men are coming with gifts, this time gold and frankincense. Because when he comes the next time, he comes to reign and not to die. Now, verse 12 says, And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now, the wise men assumed that Herod was sincere when he said he wanted to know about the child, and he'd come down and worship him. Well, if he came down, he would slay the child, of course. Had not the angel of the Lord warned them, the wise men would have gone back by Jerusalem and given the good news to Herod, and believe me, he would have killed the child. Now we find that they are alerted and they go another direction to their own country. They could continue south down to Hebron and then cross over the south of the Dead Sea. They'd be out of the range of Herod altogether. Now the angel of the Lord also appeared to Joseph and told him it's time now to get out of Bethlehem because Herod is going to attempt to kill the child. And now Joseph, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And that's Hosea 11.1. 1. And that's a marvelous prophecy because it has a historical basis. Out of Egypt the son was called, which was the nation. And out of Egypt, the son was called, who is a person. And this person here, and this is the prophecy. He went down there and stayed, Joseph did, and took the young child and the mother. Now we read verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. A part of what I'm going to say now is supposition, but part, of course, is based upon good solid fact here. We've made the statement before that the wise men did not arrive at the same time that the shepherds did. The wise men came later. Now, I know in a church pageant that down one aisle the shepherds come and down the other aisle why the wise men come. They didn't get that close together and they didn't come at the same time. The wise men arrived, and we found out last time, verse 11, when they were coming to the house. They'd moved into the house by then. Now, when Herod had inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared, and I suppose that they said, well, it was about a year ago. Because, you see, these wise men came from all quarters of the east. And I think they met in a certain place and then made their trek across the desert and came to Jerusalem. And that would consume a great deal of time. In that day, they didn't travel by jet. They traveled by camel. And some camels have one hump and some have two humps. And at best, you see it would be the one-cylinder or two-cylinder job. So they didn't get there until quite a bit afterward. 
Now, Herod had asked when they saw the star, but when he slays all the children in that area from two years old and under, I would say this, and this is the part that's supposition, Herod is so angry, and he's actually mad, by the way, that the wise man didn't come back and tell him, and he sees that he's been taken in by the wise man, that they were not cleverer than he thought they were, but they had a message from the Lord because they would have gone by and told him. But now, in his anger, I think just double. He said, well, if they said it was a year ago they saw the star, we'll just double it and make it two years and kill all the children under two years. And now we are told in verse 17, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, in Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Now, this is an unusual prophecy also. Jeremiah didn't say, in Bethlehem was there a voice heard. Now, was there a voice heard in Bethlehem? I think so. But you see, Jeremiah had said in Ramah, and that was up in his country, by the way, and Ramah's just about as far north of Jerusalem as Bethlehem is south of Jerusalem. And again, I rather think that when the soldiers said, or the captain said to Herod, well, whereabouts do you want me to begin? And what about slaying these children? What area? And I think old Herod said, well, just draw a circle around Jerusalem and make the radius of it as far south as Bethlehem and go north as far, and it included Ramah in the north, and Ramah wasn't even involved in it. So you see that Herod slew a great many children, and you can imagine the weeping in the Jerusalem area all the way from Bethlehem to Ramah, and that would be a radius of about 10, 12 miles, and it would be 20 to 25 miles across that area. So it must have been a time of great weeping on the part of these people when they lost their little ones. Now, this prophecy, you see, was literally fulfilled. Now we are told, but when Herod was dead, this is verse 19, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. And I must call attention to this. We're told that the angel of the Lord appeared to Jacob at Peniel. And now it's an angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ. But you see, he's gone down now to Egypt. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For they are dead, which sought the young child's life. Now it's essential to get him out of the land of Egypt, back up into that land. The most important reason is that he has been born under the law, and he is to live under the Mosaic law. He is the only one who really ever kept it. And we find that he's to come back, therefore, and get out from under the influence of Egypt, because, again, he's not to be raised down there, as Moses had been raised, and as the children of Israel had become a nation down there. Now he's told saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, and by the way, Archelaus, another Herod, very brutal. He was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, you find that is a fulfillment, and actually here the netzer, or the branch, or the root, as it were, is Isaiah 11, 1, Isaiah 53, 2, or Psalm 22, 6. All of that, why you have in this term Nazarene. But you see, he's given the term not only because he's a root out of the stem of Jesse, 
but he's brought up in Nazareth, and he's called a Nazarene, which fulfills the prophecy. Now, all of these four scriptural locations are fulfilled. It's as it were that he touched the base in all of these places, and what seemed a rather strange prophecy becomes now a reality, a very sane reality, and it was fulfilled in a very normal way. Now, that brings us, friends, to the third chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and now we are introduced to John the Baptist forerunner of the king, announces the kingdom and baptizes Jesus the king. Now, we have, therefore, a very remarkable chapter here. And the kingdom of heaven will come before us again. I want to turn now and read verse 1, chapter 3 of Matthew. And I'm reading now. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, all of a sudden, on the page of Scripture walks John the Baptist. And if we only had Matthew's gospel, why, we'd ask the question, where did he come from? What's his background? Because Matthew gives us none of that. And the reason is obvious. To begin with, he was to be announced, Malachi had said, that the messenger would come ahead to tell about the coming of the king. He says, I send my messenger. And this messenger was John the Baptist. And a messenger is not one that you need to know about his background at all. John the Baptist was a messenger. When the Western Union boy brings a message to your door, do you say to him, young man, did your ancestors come over on the Mayflower? What is your background? You're not interested in that. You're interested in his message. The message is all important, and that's what you want. And you thank the boy, probably give him a tip and dismiss him. You're through with him. And John the Baptist makes it very clear that he was just the messenger, and Matthew's making that clear too. And therefore, he just walks out on the page of Scripture comes preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, and this is his message, repent ye. It's a message of repentance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I think probably that we ought to deal with these two expressions that are very important, repent ye and the kingdom of heaven, and I think probably is at hand. These are all very important. Repent is an expression that's always been given to God's people turn around. Repent means it's metanoia. It means change your mind. It means you go in in one direction, turn around, and go another direction. Now, I think it's primarily for saved people. That is, for God's people in any age, repentance. They are the ones that if they're going to have revival and they're cold and indifferent, they've got to turn. That was the message to the seven churches in Asia as we saw some time ago. And it was the message of the Lord Jesus. Now, somebody says, well, isn't the unsaved supposed to repent? Not the way you think of it. He's told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said to the Philippian jailer, and that old rascal needed to do some repenting. But you see, in faith, there is repentance. You see, faith means you turn to Christ. Now, when you turn to Christ, you turn from something. And if you don't turn from something, you don't turn to him, you see. And so repentance is in the word believe today. And I think that's the primary message that should be given to the lost today is to believe. Now, a great many people like to do something. They like to put up their hand. They like to come forward in a meeting. They like to do something. And we've encouraged that, by the way. But to me, the most impressive thing is to stay right there in your seat, right where you are, and if you've made a decision, record it by writing it, but even signing a card doesn't save you. The important thing is to trust Christ as your Savior. And if you've really done it, if you've turned to him, you've turned from something. Now, the expression kingdom of heaven, we've talked about that before. That's the rule of the heavens over the earth. And the Lord Jesus is the king. And you can't have a kingdom without a king, and you can't have a king without a kingdom. What the king was, it says, my kingdom for a horse. If he traded in his kingdom for a horse, he's not a king. 
All he is is a man horseback. You have to have a king to have the kingdom. Now, what do you mean the kingdom of heaven is at hand? The kingdom of heaven is present in the person of the king, and that is it. Now, somebody says, isn't there a present reality of the kingdom of heaven? Yes. Those who come to him as Savior and acknowledge him are translated into the kingdom of his dear son. They belong to him now. But they have a more intimate relationship than a subject of the king. They're now part of the bride. Somebody says, well, they're to carry out his commands. They're more than that. May I say to you, they are to do it because they love him. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So that the kingdom of heaven is the rule of the heaven over the earth. That's not in existence today. Now, any man that makes that kind of a statement must be something wrong with his thinking, or he must be totally ignorant of the world we live in. He's not reigning today in any form, shape, or fashion, only in the heart of those who accept him. They're the only ones. Now, he's coming someday to establish his kingdom on the earth. When he does, he'll put down the rebellion. And believe me, he's going to put it down. Now, the kingdom of heaven was present in the person of the king, and that was the only way it was. Now he says, for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, that is Isaiah, and you'll find it in Isaiah 43. You see how Matthew keeps telling us everything that he's recording is in fulfillment of prophecy, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's all that John the Baptist claimed for himself he was a voice crying in the wilderness. Now he says, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. He's a strange individual, isn't he? Talk about one following a diet and one dressing very unusual. I hate to say this, but I want to tell you, John would probably qualify in his looks as a hippie. Just look at this. The same John had his raiment of camel's hair. His leathern girdle was about his loins. His meat was locust and wild honey. And we're told he'd never shaved. Long hair. This is the man. Unusual man, friends. And a man with a mission. He's an Old Testament character. Walks out of the Old Testament onto the page of the New Testament. He's the last of the Old Testament prophets. Now we're going to see something about him as we go through then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. They went out to him. He did not rent a stadium or an auditorium or a church, and there was no committee that invited him. He didn't come to town at all. You want to hear John, you went out to where he was. And I tell you, the Spirit of God is on this man. And they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. In other words, all of this denoted a change in the lives of these people. The very fact of the baptism was their leaving the old life and now turning to a new one. All of this was there. Now notice something else. Verse 7, And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, and notice who was coming, he said unto them, Now this is no way to greet these dignified visitors. Listen to him. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Suppose your preacher got up next Sunday morning and said, Old oh, generation of vipers, the deacons would be looking for another preacher, I imagine. May I say this is really strong language, and he's talking to the dignified Pharisees and Sadducees. He cries out to them, Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. In other words, you've got to demonstrate this. You just don't go through the act of baptism. You have to present fruit in your life. Now, he says, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. That, my friend, was a strong statement he made there. You can understand why he was not elected the most popular man of the year in Judea. We're going to have to leave off right there today. So until... Next time, my beloved, may God richly bless you. If you'd like to go deeper in your personal study of God's Word, 
You can do that when you check out the resources at ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help you find something specific. Well, our journey through the New Testament book of Matthew continues tomorrow, right here on Through the Bible. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?